would like to open the floor for questions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I can't help looking at that and thinking what the world is missing in terms of art, culture, medicine because of this destruction. Um, so I have two questions. The first is around brain drain. I'm a nurse in the United States and I'm on the receiving end of what I would call brain waste because uh, physicians, nurses come here and they are not allowed to work as physicians or nurses and yet they've left these places of great need. I'm in the place of teaching them here. How do you encourage people to stay in such difficult circumstances? And the second is comes to the action part of the colloquium, which is what would you say is the immediate need that you would want us to uh, communicate to parishes and what is the sustainable plan? So to questions. Uh, thank you for your question. About medicine, I didn't like to, to mention my personal uh, voluntary work. Uh, I've been for eight months at the Jordanian-Syrian borders in the Ramtha area, accepting from the front line uh, trauma patients. Some of them have been operated in a field uh, hospitals inside Syria and coming for a complementary treatment. Uh, because as you know, for example, a vascular injury, they don't have the capacity to do it. They just clamp the main artery and send it to us. Uh, so by, in my opinion, by being with those people, irregardless about the position, myself as a consultant, it's rarely to find consultant to go and to volunteer. Usually you can find small uh, doctors, newly graduated, uh, to gain experience first and then to help. Uh, by sitting, speaking with those people, by doing a special department between the team for psychosocial issues, uh, by trying to bring somebody. For example, we had a patient, a female patient, both amputated lower limbs, eight years old. And she was alone, not a mom, not an aunt, nobody. With this girl, how you can, how she can take you into confidence and speak with you. It was really difficult, but at the end, people has nothing to do except of that. They have to move because of their trauma situation. Now, some of them have removed because of their children and went to the camps. Now, the Zaatari camp, which was referred in the morning, it's about 700,000 Syrians in it. And uh, the situation, yes, much better than before, but it is disaster, especially in winter. There is no sewage. You have to wait for the toilets for a long period of time. They've changed the tents to a prefabricated, a small, uh, it is not even a van. Uh, so it's very difficult. Now, I have a, 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 a lot of uh, points on those who are coming from outside. And this is what I mentioned before. It's very good to have volunteers from outside, but it's very bad to have employed people from outside, even with less experience and with less expertise than the locals, and to consider them as expatriates. And because they are expatriates, they are much clever than you. This is an issue which is affecting the whole humanitarianism, a knife in the back. Let me give you, since you are a nurse, and sorry for taking time of my colleagues, an example. I am a consultant. When I write an order in a chart of a patient, it is my responsibility that I have wrote that order. I can't accept any practitioner or internship or staff nurse or, or program coordinator to come and to change my order. Because they have done all protocol, for example, for painkillers, which I am not using. And it's my right after 35 years to have my own protocol for painkiller without using any uh, narcotics, for example. 
to come and to change it because they believe that patient must not suffer, but at the end you will throw him into addiction. I can't accept a program coordinator, which is not even a staff nurse, to change my orders with the title of expatriate. And she's taking salary 10 times as much as the locals. So the budget or the bridges which they are giving, they are giving for themselves. And they are not giving to help people. You can find to help people, except of doing 10 operations, you can do 100 operations with the same budget if it was well managed. This is what I say that please come and see how things is on the ground. For example, I've been a volunteer surgeon. I was not consultant at that time in 1990 in Iraq. My wife, she was newly born. My fourth child, which was a baby boy, over three girls, and those from who are the Arab world, they can understand what it means that to have a baby boy after three girls. How precious is this children? I left him when his, his age was three months. Because my church and my, my late father have learned me what is humanitarianism and what is volunteer, regardless what I will suffer. They stand on the door, all of them, the four of them crying, please don't leave us, don't leave us. And this was the first car which left Jordan through a medical team, the Arab medical team, to Baghdad during the bombardment of the 30 countries at that time, before the invasion. So it's something in the spirit of the people. Because of that, I don't like telling that we have volunteer is not enough. No. Yes, I can understand how precious is the employees of the NGOs. And I can know, I, I know very well that they are even taking less than their price in the market. But don't overdo it. Try to build the spirit of volunteerism between Christians, especially in the region. So I have another question, I think. I have a couple of questions as well. Um, one is more of a, maybe of a side note, kind of a personal interest of mine. I noticed the graffiti in the video that we saw at the end. Um, I was just wondering how that, where that, the source of the graffiti, what is it and what, what does it mean? I'm wondering to come about. Um, also, I'd like to ask as a second question, uh, for those that are not familiar with the IOCC, um, who constitutes the IOCC? Like, is, which jurisdictions? Who supports it? Who does the work for IOCC? The first question I can't, I didn't hear. The second question, Samir, can I answer? Um, well, the. Ah, the graffiti on the walls. Okay. Uh, some some of them, for example, uh, it's a very nice question because we didn't take pictures for everybody because everything had been destroyed. Everyone put his name where his house was. So when, when all this will go, they know which land was theirs. <laughs> Some of those are the, the names. Others, for example, the one of the tablet, it was the mosque which was destroyed. And they are telling that this is here, the mosque of the, of the martyrs, the name of the mosque before destroying. Uh, some of them was uh, victory. Uh, some of them was against the uh, Israeli invasion. Uh, some of them was political nature. And the picture which you saw was a picture of a martyr before the war. OK, your question about IOCC, please. Can you repeat it, please? Um, essentially, I just wanted, for those that are not familiar with IOCC, I just want to know um, basically who constitutes IOCC, who supports it, where do the funds come from, um, who does the work for IOCC? Maybe this question should be addressed to the IOCC staff. We have some IOCC staff here, yes. Um, sorry. Uh, IOCC is, a, is an organization uh, based in the United States. It was founded in 1992 by what was then the Standing Conference of Canonical Orthodox Bishops in the Americas what today we call the Assembly 
of canonical Orthodox bishops in the United States of America, I think. <laughs> uh, and uh, therefore, it uh, constitutes every uh, Orthodox jurisdiction uh, at the highest levels, uh, all the way down to each individual parish uh, throughout the United States. And our supporters, uh, of course, include people from outside of the United States. And our partners uh, include uh, faith-based, non-faith-based uh, organizations all across the world. Um, at this point, since Pascal, you, uh, you kind of addressed a question, I invite other panelists from previous panels from this morning, from uh, yesterday, uh, to chime in, especially since now we've heard everyone, uh, of course, direct questions to this particular panel in the Middle East, but of course, if there are questions that uh, you would like to ask someone else who spoke in a previous panel, or if other panelists kind of want to join the conversation, please feel free. This is for uh, Dr. Laham. Your doctor? Uh, I'm, oh. not, I'm not a doctor. That's OK. We'll all be doctors. <laughs> and it's his birthday. He's a bush, bush, He's an engineer. Bush doctor. You're either, in, in the Middle East, you're either a doctor or a mohandis. So you're one of the, but you should be a mudir. Uh, my question for you is, could you share the challenges that you face? I was in Syria many years ago. The challenges that you face still living in Damascus in terms of how you can how you function with the, the current uh, government of uh, the Assad regime? Does it affect how does it affect your organization? We as as uh, as a church or or what? What do you mean? How would you? I mean, uh, we as as an organization or what? Organization. First, I don't want to use the regime because uh, you see uh, this is yes yeah, yes this is uh, the government yes. Um, uh, I mean, I mean uh, the. Uh, uh, I, I want to, to refer to, to the concept now in the Arab world that uh, revolution means to change the governments or to, to change systems without having, let's say, the advocate, for example, basis or understanding what does it mean revolution in terms of, let's say, uh, democratical changes or understanding the democratic terminology. So uh, unfortunately, in the Arab world, this is, let's say, my, my own understanding and reading, that revolution or political revolution or po political changes means that you have to change system and regimes without having substitute, for example, systems that can really keep the stability and uh, a very peaceful transfer of responsibilities or administration and everything. And if you want to change anything very, very radically, so the result would be catastrophic. And I think we have a lot of uh, historical, uh, let's say, examples, not only in the Arab world, but all over the world, that if you want to change anything very, very quickly, so I think the outcome would be disastrous uh, at all levels. Syria is still functioning, for example, especially in the area, in the places where still under the control of the government, so life continues, in spite of all daily challenges, in spite of all, let's say, the shedding of mortars, missiles sometimes, and hearing bombings, bombs all the time. And, uh, uh, but life, li life continues. Many people who cannot uh, really sustain their living, so they left already. And uh, we heard a question about, let's say, the trains of the, let's say, uh, of brains, already Syria lost a lot of doctors, engineers, uh, uh, capitals, businessmen. So we are suffering a lot of not having enough doctors nowadays in all, even public and private hospitals. And uh, but, but people also who uh, have the capacity or the possibility to move, they have already moved. And there are uh, and those who really had to leave and really live as refugees. And I was talking about maybe a huge number of refugees in neighboring countries. So many of them are 
and the majority are living, let's say, in tents or in places or in shelters. Mm -hmm. Lebanon, Egypt, uh, Lebanon, even in Egypt, they are not living in shelters, but there are a lot of Syrians here, and they are suffering a lot. But now, Jordan and Turkey and in Lebanon, so hundreds of thousands living in tents and really suffering uh, a lot. But, but the ones who, who cannot move uh, still living and uh, because they don't have any other choices. And there are a lot of people who have the capacity and the possibility to move, and they have a lot of money, but they insisted to stay. They insisted to stay because they believe in the country, because they do believe that they, are, they have a role to play. And uh, also, uh, I can assure you that, uh, of course, uh, all of us, we have a lot of criticism, and we, we have a lot of, let's say, our own opinions concerning the performance of the government over the last, over the recent years, in terms of, let's say, corruption, in terms of a lot of things, okay? But at least, for example, and I want to be, I'm, I'm completely neutral and uh, in, in, in saying this, in Syria, before the crisis, the, the far remote village in Syria, even, let's say, in East Syria or in South Syria, all people were enjoying having electricity, water, and also uh, to have access or, or to public education free of charge in schools or in universities. And all people were able to enjoy having their income, really, and to uh, uh, ensure uh, their daily bread. And all of a sudden, of course, due of the, 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 the place become like a, a, an arena for, for, for all possible, for example, groups who come from outside in order to liberate Syria, or maybe to really to, to uh, 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 to, uh, they came for jihad, you see. So uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, the, the situation completely become uh, in a different, for example, uh, shape. And this is why now most of the Syrians, including the ones who were criticizing the government and they were against the government at the very beginning, who were against the government and really who played a role in really, for example. Uh, 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 either, for example, to, to join some groups. Um, I'm not criticizing here. I think the mistakes come from, from all parts. Uh, uh, so uh, now they say, OK, we, uh, we, we hope that really to, to retain what we lost, let's say, before the crisis. So now there are a lot of, let's say, even Muslims, Christians, who uh, uh, become believing that the uh, the uh, Arab Spring was really like a big slogan, uh, and uh, uh, knowing what's happening in the neighboring Arab worlds, because unfortunately the media do not reflect what's going on in Libya or in elsewhere, only it, it focuses on some places where they, by intention, they want to show, let's say, what, is, what are the purposes behind, for example, like concentrating sometimes on Syria or sometimes on Yemen or sometimes on Egypt. So now many people, who were criticizing the system and really who were really contributed, for example, to hold arms now, they become aware that they lost everything without any results. And nothing changed, unfortunately. Nothing changed. So we are continuing our life. And I think it is really a costly, costly for example, price we pay. Uh, many of us have the means and the access to leave and to withdraw and really to enjoy, for example, peaceful life abroad. But I think to whom we should really, or we shall la leave, let's say, our responsibilities. Yes, when I mentioned that really we leave our homes every day, but we don't know if we can get back safe. Uh, it's not just uh, like I say that, but this is what we are witnessing on a daily basis. So we have to believe on our country. If we could talk about Christian presence, if we, do, if we do believe that our land really witnessed, for example, the footsteps of, of our Lord, I think we have to pay the price. We have to pay the price. You don't have any other choice. So life continues. Our humanitarian work continues with the help of our donors. Thanks God that really they do believe in our work. And they are doing, let's say, uh, a great job in order to provide the advocate funding at all levels. But also, you cannot imagine, for example, what kind of hope we are delivering and we are, let's say, uh, offering silently to the people. Uh, just I want, even me, for example, I, I, I had planned to leave myself in order to save my children. 
yes, I put my family now in Beirut, but personally I'm still living in Damascus. And one, and one person told me once who has great connections with outside world, and then he told me, if you think yourself to leave, you will not imagine what message you will transmit to the others when, let, when you let people really hear that you left. You should be there. And that was like a big lesson to me to stay there. And if I leave, and if I, the other leaves, so for example, how we can really uh, fortify, maybe strengthen, for example, our volunteers to stay. So it's really uh, a big exam for all of us. Uh, and maybe this is like, like maybe a God, for example, sometimes permit to pass through such experience on daily basis. We do hope really, uh, uh, in the end, of course, I think uh, uh, ahead of us, I mean, if, if the, if the uh, uh, armed conflicts stop today, I think we have a lot to do tomorrow. Because you cannot imagine, for example, when we sit by one table in order really to rebuild the dialogue and really to promote the reconciliation among conflicted parties, what kind of difficulties we will face. And this is, let's say, the role of Christians, because we are accepted by all. We are neutral from the very beginning. Many people were accusing us because we didn't really take like one direction, whether to be with or against. We wanted really to save the country. We didn't want from the very beginning, neither to save, let's say, the, the, the government or let's say to save the other party. And this is, let's say, is a very important issue uh, on our shoulders. And I want to conclude that one day, of course, during our implementation, so I was received, I received a call from the United Nations, from OCHA office. The OCHA office, all, all of you know that this is the coordination humanitarian office of uh, UN humanitarian agencies. And then they requested us to do a big implementation, a big program in Daraa. Daraa is just next to the Jordanian border. And when we talk about a Zaatari camp, this is not far away from Daraa. I said, why us there? Because of course in Daraa we have a very active office and we lost two persons from Daraa during the shelling, let's say, of the mortars, which come from the other side of, of, of the, where, we are, where we are. And until this moment, for example, our staff in Daraa, we have about 50 persons working there, and we are the only one, the only active, let's say, body working in Daraa, versus for, compared even with the UN agency. They told us, because you are accepted by all. If we, if we give uh, uh, money to, 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 to the other side, so people will not come because you know that sometimes we politicize even the humanitarian work. So because you are accepted by all, you are standing at the same distance by all. So we want you to implement this program. And really we got funding and people even living in the areas under the control of armed groups were able even to cross, let's say, the checkpoints and come to our distribution places and got the aid and got back to their homes. So this is a big witness, in my opinion. And this is the role where, which, which we have to maintain, not now, but also in the, for the future. I would like just to comment. Yes, please, please Father. No, no, please. No, after you. Uh, I had a question, but uh, OK. I just want to comment without embarrassing anybody. Uh, in my opinion, uh, food, electricity, and water is not everything. The rule of law, human rights, democracy is most important for some, for a lot of people than food, electricity, and water. I don't want to go into political criticism. I am not afraid from anybody. This is my position always. But I have to say that head of churches, head of churches in Syria, in my opinion, their position was not right to be supporting the government, the regime, uh, whatever you want the name to be given uh, to those who govern Syria with this way which they've done. In my opinion, they lost their dignity in front of their people. I am speaking about head of churches and not only population. I am against anybody to leave. We have to struggle to change from inside. I am with Samer on this 
option. But on the another option, this can be stopped four years ago without having this huge destruction in the infrastructure of a country which its people build it, and not only the government. Thank you. Happy birthday, doctor. Thank you. <laughs> I am online, my dear. I know, I know. Uh, 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 two, two quick questions. Um, uh, the refugee situation, uh, amazing numbers. Just, I, I don't think I can understand that, that many people living in one place in tents. Um, it's heartbreaking to, to kind of uh, think about what our brothers and sisters are going through. Um, and I know that the churches have insisted that our, our people should stay there, that they, these are Christian lands, these are our lands that belong to multicultural lands, and that uh, without the presence of the Christians there, kind of the Middle East is no longer the Middle East, it just becomes something else. Um, but how realistic is it that these people will return and will return to their homes? And I mean, I won't even talk about going back to normal, but at least going back to wherever their homeland is. That's number one, and, and that's refugees from kind of the broad Middle East, not just in this case now it's Syria, but um, my second question, it kind of goes to something that was mentioned a little bit, kind of the uh, inter-Orthodox communication. Uh, a few years ago or several years ago, there was a meeting of the ancient patriarchates, uh, the ancient leaders of the patriarchate, the leaders of the ancient patriarchates and the um, Archbishop of Cyprus, kind of representing the Middle East churches coming together, I guess, at the beginning of the crisis. Um, I wonder how much are the churches speaking to each other, not past each other, or against each other? Because it's very difficult to kind of understand who is our partner from the outside coming in. Uh, but, you know, really, I hope that there is some intercommunication and cooperation uh, between these you know, five churches, Constantinople, uh, Alexandria, Antioch, Jerusalem, Cyprus, you're all in the same boat, um, and it kind of, it, it would at least make us uh, have some hope, at least if the churches are cooperating. So maybe number one for the refugees, and number two, the inter-Orthodox communication and cooperation. Uh, about terminology, I am not going to answer. I am not going to take monopoly the, the floor. There is only two refugees around the world, Palestinian refugees and Cypriot refugees. All the others are displaced or visitors. So please let us use the terminology in its right place. The Syrians are displaced because their country is not occupied. The Cypriots are refugees because their other part of our island is occupied. Palestinians are refugees because their country is occupied. So there is a completely different between displaced, visitor, or stateless, or so on. Now, about the initiative, the Orthodox initiative, it was active in the first beginning, but because of lack of funding, upon to my knowledge, uh, nowadays it's working with a minimal amount. They have an office in Amman, which the Patriarchate of Jerusalem is running, with one member uh, staff of the Middle East Council of Churches, uh, they visited, uh, and he was the only church leader, the first, not the only, the first church leader, Patriarch Theophilus, to visit the Zaatari camp. Uh, but after that, uh, I think that everything dropped down because usually when the crisis started, everybody jumped from the chairs. Then they sleep comfortably for another crisis to come up. Probably very quickly on the first question of displaced people. I mean, uh, I said probably we have to keep to hold on hope where there's no hope. I mean, it's very difficult for those who left Mosul area and the Ninawa Valley, for instance, the Christians who have been pushed out of the, their own land, ancestral land. When you meet them in Erbil, in northern Iraq, they, they would say now, it's out of question for us to go back. It's, they, don't, they don't want to go back. They feel that they have been be betrayed by their own neighbors. So it's not a question that... And they, don't, they no longer feel that they are welcomed in their ancestral land. So they, 
they are now in, in waiting in, in Erbil or in Dhok or in Slaimani to, to be resettled in, uh, in, in Australia, in America, in Europe, in Sweden or whatever. So it will take them three, four years for the procedure to go on. And so unfortunately, there is no discourse that the churches can, can, can maintain to, to encourage them to stay in, in, in their land. Now, having said this, it is impossible to think that they, why, why should we encourage them to, to, get, to, to, to go back if there is no peace, if there is no security, if there is no future? Uh, and uh, it's, I mean, we are talking about one, let's call it minority, it's not, but whatever, I mean, what about the Yazidi? What about the Sunnis who have left? The what about the Shia who have left? I mean, it's not we are singling out the Christians, but I mean, it's it's the problem of of so many other communities in in uh, talking about only Iraq. So the question is, we cannot have a protection of minorities. It's absurd. The Americans have been in Iraq have invaded, I mean, I'm, I'm in the States probably, I can criticize it, you cannot do it. I mean, you can do it because you have. But they have invaded Iraq, they were there, the army, and they didn't protect the Christians. Are we expecting now Putin to come with his soldiers to protect us in the region? I mean, there is no way that to protect minorities in the region unless you have uh, a social contract with your neighbors unless your neighbors feel that you are part of them and, and you feel that you are part of your neighbors. So going, going back to the region is possible if there is peace in the region. I think that it's not like Turkey, not yet like Turkey. Mosul is not yet like Turkey. The rights of the Christians to their land is there. The rights of other communities to their homes and lands is there. Uh, what is missing is, is a comprehensive and inclusive political solution for Iraq. The last 10 years of Maliki's government were worse than, than Saddam's governance, and it was under the Americans. The Americans divided the Iraqis into Shia and Sunni and Kurds. The Americans dismantled the, 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 the army and put and excluded. The exclusion was an American policy. It, it was a Bremer's policy. I mean, it's not an earthquake. Yes. Yes. This is what, what we mean. Find a political solution that is inclusive of everyone. And I'm confident, hopeful, where there is no hope that Christians might come back. Syria is a different case. Egypt is another case. Lebanon, I mean, uh, it's, I mean there is no time to, 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 uh, to discuss specific situation of Christians in the region. There are some common features, but we cannot speak about the situation of Christians as a whole. As, uh, yes, uh, I have a question also. As regards the, oh, the, the question of the churches, uh, I said it, I mean, they need a common concerted coming together, permanent concertation and permanent coming together. What's missing is that, okay, they, they, they meet as religious leaders, but what is needed is religious actors. What is needed is people on the ground, uh, intellectuals from these churches, uh, consultants, people who, who understand what's going on people who analyze the situation, who, who are beside these church leaders and informing them, discussing with them. I mean, church leaders are very important in our life. We respect them, we venerate them. We, I mean, they are representing God on earth, whatever you, I mean, they, they have the stamp of the Holy Spirit in their hands. But, but, but when it comes to, to, to concrete situations on the ground, they also need uh, poor people to, 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 uh, with whom to, <laughs> You know, it's so Stanford is so fear. I don't know. That's a, a seal, the seal of the Holy Spirit. That's online. Or yes. Um, well, uh, I, I have a question which is related to the cooperation, uh, possible cooperation of Christians in the Middle East. 
um, uh, outside also of the Orthodox Church, because uh, that is the, 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 the tragic situation in the Middle East is affecting uh, all Christian communities. Uh, BBC has recently uh, broadcasted a documentary. Unfortunately, very l little material in that film is related to the Orthodox Christians, only something about Orthodox Christian in Palestine. But um, we can see that also particularly Assyrian uh, uh, Christians in Iraq uh, have a terrible situation. It was uh, very painful to hear one of the um, Assyrian priests uh, who said, well, don't send us any help. We just help us leave and live in dignity. It was really very painful to hear that. Uh, my question is actually, uh, is there any um, inter-Christian cooperation on humanitarian efforts to relieve the crisis for all Christians? In, 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 in Syria, for instance, we have still uh, the Archbishop, uh, the Patriarch's um, brother, and the Archbishop uh, um, pa 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 Pavlos, yes, I think, and, uh, and also uh, one uh, more bishop from the Assyrian uh, church missing, actually. So, so it's a problem of all. The, how can you comment on this? I, I want to be realistic. Um, unfortunately, uh, we don't have uh, uh, advocate for example, cooperation as it should be, in order to reflect the oneness, for example, of the churches. The uh, conflict uh, uh, sometimes either, for example, to unify people and to bring them together or to divide them. I mean, all, of course, uh, none, even single church or single organization or church-related organization can really meet the needs of the people and uh, all churches are called really to try to meet the needs of their congregation and their communities. But what happened that uh, really uh, some churches uh, really provided aid only to their community members and not to everybody. Why, for example, I'm not defending the Orthodox here, but this is a reality. Why, for example, through the aid we are receiving from our donors, whether it be in kind or in cash in order to buy uh, stuff from the local market. We are distributing everything to everybody. Uh, the percentage of non-Christians is about 75%, and the Christians, 25%. And this is normal because you know the number of the affected or IDP's numbers of the Muslims are much more than the Christians. But among the Christians, we are distributing our aid to all denominations. We never ask anyone about, let's say, whether you are a Catholic or Orthodox or Protestant. Why, for example, the other churches brought money only for their communities? And this has really created a lot of internal challenge and pro problems to our church, because you cannot imagine that two neighbors living in one building and then a box of food come from a church and the other one shared the, the, book, the, bo the box of food between him and his neighbor. So, and also a matter of competition, uh, because each church wants to have like a special agency or humanitarian agency within the church, and to attract, let's say, to get money from, from the donors. And sometimes the uh, big donors, instead of really uh, unifying, for example, the business, they are really giving money to everybody, and then the competition uh, is there, you see? at all levels. So uh, we have this problem, uh, but we, uh, uh, of course, uh, in our department, we don't want to go into such internal challenges because we don't have time really to deal with it. We keep, for example, even it is a challenge that we are receiving from our bishops from, from all areas. By saying that, uh, uh, we have, you have to have also a special funding for the Orthodox. And all the time we say we are completely neutral and we are following, let's say, the teaching of Jesus Christ. And not all our bishops, not all of our bishops, for example, are convinced with this all the time because, of course, they are receiving a lot of challenges from the communities. And this is why uh, at, at, at the national level we are very much respected and appreciated, but in, on, on many, for example, situations, 
we are receiving a lot of criticism from our church, from our archdiocese in different places. So uh, we tried through the Middle East Council of Churches to consolidate a little bit, for example, the work and really by bringing churches together. But the funding coming to the council is very little versus, let's say, compared with the, with the funding coming, let's say, to our department. But, uh, but this, is a, this is a reality, and uh, we have to face it in a way or another. But I'm, I'm sure that uh, all other churches are receiving a lot of funding. Uh, of course, the Catholic Church uh, really uh, is receiving a significant funding from CRS and from Caritas. Uh, of course, some, uh, some uh, uh, offices are helping everybody, not only the, the, the Catholic, but everybody. The Protestants are receiving also a lot of uh, funding from uh, their own sources, from here or from elsewhere. Uh, of course, the priority for them is to provide aid to the Protestants because they are few, very, very few in number, very tiny minority. You can count how many, how many families you have. But also, in order to show that, uh, to show the ecumenical aspect of the aid, so that they are distributing aid to the others also at the same time. But yet we don't have like one agenda among all churches, even at the level of the humanitarian aid. Uh, Father, without going into the theological differences, but I have to mention that the Assyrians, even during the regime of Saddam, one million of them have uh, uh, left the country to European countries. So it was since the first beginning, and due to their unacceptance from the other Christians in the region, they had this program of uh, metanastasis, um, a refugee to other countries. So it's not because of the uh, today's situation. This is coming up now. I, I heard that uh, uh, Saddam Hussein was somewhat pro-Christian, actually, in some of the things he did, and that when, in, you know, when he was found in that uh, hole in the backyard, that that house belonged to Syrian Christians. Do you know if that's true? That's something I heard on the news. Actually, I think it was the Greek news. Uh, now, <laughs> I will answer you frankly. There was no hole in which Saddam was found. This is a scenario uh, just for the media. Second, secondly, uh, the first part of your question, uh, yes, Saddam uh, was uh, pre-Christians. I've attended four Christian conferences during the sanctions. And he admired a lot the work of the Christian people during the 10 years of sanctions from all the offices around the world even uh, the MACC. His foreign minister, which he is still in prison until now, and uh, unfortunately, uh, the United States of America did not help his situation. He was a friend of the Pope, and his Tariq Aziz is a Christian. Uh, so uh, Saddam Hussein was able, in his way of dictatorship, how to hold all uh, religious parties uh, on equal basis without having democracy and with corruption and with 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 this one. I am not with the Saddam regime, uh, but Christians at that time uh, has the right to do. I can I have to confess that he gave us a permission, which was an extra permission. Any helps coming from churches outside. 25% of it will go to churches in Baghdad, in Iraq. And 75% must be handled to the Iraqi Red Crescent Society. And we've been the only Middle East Council of Churches have this exemption. So he recognized the work which we've been doing at that time. And he, at the same time, uh, considered and had a, an excellent relations with the head of churches uh, in Baghdad, including the MACC representative nowadays. I don't know if he is still Bishop Avak, the Armenian Orthodox Bishop in Iraq. It's just not well known in the United States that, that the mistake 
states that were made with that. Many things in the United States was not known. <laughs> I don't want to end this conversation, but I see that the hour is uh, fastly approaching to the end, and I wanted to hear from any of the panelists. Um, well, first of all, to thank all of them. Uh, I, like a few others, have been the recipients of the wisdom and the experience uh, of those of you who have been involved in this um, noble work that you have undertaken. And uh, just sitting here and hearing the heart-wrenching stories uh, that you've shared with us uh, has aroused, I'm sure, in others, as in me, the desire to respond. Uh, first of all, let me ask, what, where do we go from here? And I use we, we because I would like to include myself in whatever uh, is foreseen as the next step I mean, we've heard the, the amazing things that we've heard these past two days, and I commend those who initiated this uh, colloquium, um, every one of you, and you know who you are. Uh, we have spoken personally. Uh, I commend you for what you've done. What do you perceive as the next step, and how can we participate? What can we do to... Um, to share what we have been privileged to hear these last two days. So I, I, whoever would like to offer some thoughts on those uh, concerns, I'd be very grateful. Uh, thank you. It's, a, it's an ex excellent question. I think from here that we have to do a, an excellent advocacy work to end all illegal occupations, to have reconciliation, and him I mean by the Cypriot uh, issue and the Palestinian issue, to have the holy place, Jerusalem, an open city for three religions and two people, and to live all together as neighbors, as our Bible and as our Jesus Christ have learned us. This is the message. Please, let us try to stop relief issues and to start on development issues, to build societies living with all their differences one with each other. If we can start doing this kind of work of advocacy, which I doubt, frankly, with the today's political circumstances, that we will succeed, it, but we have to start the first step by doing this so as to witness our Christian and our orthodoxy in the work which we have to do. Eleni had a question. I'll say something. Thank you, Dr. Batsavos, for your question. Um, as I said earlier, I'm fairly new, a novice to uh, the Middle East, and I don't dare say that I understand um, the situation there. Um, I don't dare say that I understand the pain that the Israelis and the Palestinians have gone through and will go through, unfortunately. But what can, I can advise is prayer, first and foremost. Prayer that the illegal occupation is ended prayer for strength for the people that are there trying to make a difference. Um, I think a second option is material and financial contribution to the right organizations, to the churches, to so they can disseminate the funds where they're needed. Um, third of all, I think that more of a long-term um, contribution is to groom future um, here, future young adults to you know, represent the church in the public policy community. Um, where they can talk to Congress, where they can talk to the UN, where they can talk to you and, 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 and bring up these, these, these issues that are going on in the Middle East. Um, and I think, um, fourth of all, there's so many, so many things that we can say. Uh, just uh, to stop the illegal occupation, the demolition, the, the, the illegal demolition of Palestinian villages right around you know, the Western Wall, especially uh, Silwan, where you have these, this, you know, you have these uh, uh, displaced Palestinians who are, their homes are literally bulldozed. They either die in, in the action or they're placed behind the wall like prisoners in an, in an effort to minimize domestic 
you know, um, terrorism. If that's the case, you have one of the greatest intelligence, you know, communities in the world. Go in, find the perpetrators, do something about it. But don't let innocent people die over things that are the things that are going on. And uh, I think that we need to raise an awareness here. I think the reality of what's going on, at least in my experience in the, in, in Israel Palestine, is not what's being portrayed in the United States. And we need to be real, and we need to call it the way that it is. We need to take the things that we hear in our own personal experiences by visiting there and portraying it to the American people. But what's really going on there? That it's not only the Jews versus the Muslims and the Muslims versus the Jews, but the Christians are also suffering. And that, okay, maybe they're not actively being eradicated, but there are no domestic policies put in place to protect the Christians or even vouchsafe their existence. Because I think that most of America is totally clueless about what's going on over there. So I think that, you know, in our parishes, in our churches, in our masses, in our liturgies, wherever we go is an opportunity to preach not only Christ crucified and resurrected, but also the current situation of what's going on in the Holy Land and in the greater Middle East. And please don't be afraid to come and visit. Absolutely. 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 Well, I came. I came. You know, there is no substitute for, you know, for boots on the ground. But for the people who are not financially able or who can't because they have families or for whatever obligations, do what you can from here. Find every opportunity that you can to, to, to spread the message. But if you can come, come. There's no substitute for boots on the ground. Um, just uh, a footnote to the other comments, and circling back to where we started yesterday, uh, I, I was struck by Dr. Ade's, um, Dr. Kallis's, uh comment that um, little support is coming from Orthodox churches abro from abroad to the region, in particular to, well, to the region. And I, I, I take that as a challenge to all of us. Uh, I think it's quite shocking, the apathy and willingness to look away in the face of what is going on, not only in the region. The region, I think there's a specificity to what's happening in the region because this is the place of the three Abrahamic traditions, one of which is literally being erased as we all sit here in our comfortable space. And I, But I think that what we're seeing in the region is emblematic of what's happening in so many other parts of the world and here in the United States, in many cases, let's make no mistake, those problems are not only out there. The problems that we're talking about, which are problems of human dignity and human suffering and human thriving, are happening all around us. But regarding the, the region in particular and Christians in the region, I, I, you know, and here I'm on the air, so now it's done. But I do, I think the apathy has been shocking, and I think it's up to each of us individually to um, educate ourselves. And if we're talking about what churches can do, I think in the space of our church, and where's Metropolitan Maxime, again, I'm going to invoke him, in terms of our ecclesiology, um, in the physical space of our churches, we need to share what is happening in the world and not be afraid that if we speak about what's happening in the world, that's politics, because that's not politics. That's humanity. And if we have all of this beautiful theology, and whereas Father Luke, I'll quote you, it shouldn't, you know, become sterile and, you know, um, sclerotic and become theoretical theology. There is no such thing as theoretical theology. Then it's not theology anymore. So I think, you know, there are things we can do in order to raise our own awareness and consciousness. And as Christians who are free and as people who live in freedom, we have a responsibility to all of those who are not free in our own places and in other places around the world. So I think it's a kind of personal challenge you pose to all of us. And then as far as our churches go, again, education, pastoral guidance, pastoral education, and institutional programs and recognizing that, you know, the, the business of theology and the work of theology is not only occurring in the space of, only in the space of seminaries, only in religious studies departments. It's a way of life if we truly believe what we're commissioned to believe. And, and I think if we, we truly internalize those messages, we'll work with each other and we'll also be able to work with 
other faith traditions and believers and non-believers. But I mean, let's wake up. I mean, that's Rivarita, you know, we have to like wake ourselves up. So anyway. I will give you, uh, yes, yes. And I've been held, uh, I have and I've been held to the Harub Khuri. Arabic, hello Arabic, hello Arabic. Since she's from Taibi, our, our patriarchate have a school in Taibi. The patriarch, his would have, forget, have forbidden to go to the court for any student who is not paying tuition. And he's pay, paying on their behalf the tuitions so as the school can continue to run. This is a way how you can fundraise. You can adopt one children in an orthodox school. That means that you are helping the patriarchate to spend the money which is paying for the teachers for another purpose. I, I, I brought the example of Taibi school because I know its condition and I know that the patriarchate is paying more than $100,000 per year to support that school because the unemployment of the families can't give them the, uh, the way to pay the tuitions which they have to pay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your presentations. I, I have only one question to Michelle, but before that, yeah. Bef it, 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 and I think it's a difficult That's one. <laughs> Michelle, sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, before that, uh, I, I remember listening to all of you that the, the last century, the dialogue between Protestant and Orthodox was that the Protestant insisted a lot on uh, crucifixion and the Orthodox a lot on resurrection. So probably as Orthodox, we should look again carefully what crucifixion is all about. Then when next time we visit all these uh, beautiful places, we have to remember that uh, Holy Land is not only a place with great history and uh, beautiful churches and uh, long tradition, but uh, it is also a place full of pain, uh, full of crying, full of suffering and injustice. And of course, it's a place full of hope, as uh, you, ho you have already said. Okay, now to my good friend, Michelle, you know, Michelle, I will go directly to the question. Are you satisfied with uh, what WCC programs have uh, achieved till, till now uh, in the uh, Middle East? And uh, what is uh, your vision for the future? No, 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 no. I will respond very, very frankly and very openly. I'm not afraid of anything, neither of government nor of... <laughs> Now, I think that if the WCC began earlier to be interested in the question in the Holy Land, when they first launched the program to combat racism, and uh, uh, that was that was I don't know why it was decided it's only focusing on South Africa and apartheid and not on on all kinds of liberation all over the world. I think that we would have been elsewhere now. Uh, in, in, in building awareness in our member churches about the Israel-Palestine conflict. Now, the real work that is being done in the WCC on this issue has begun in 2000-2002, when, uh, when the uh, ecumenical accompaniment program in Palestine and Israel was initiated there. And uh, so for the last uh, 12 years, let's say now, uh, the, the, this program has, uh, has um, uh, had an, an important impact in, in, in different member churches, especially in the north, where we have accompaniers living there for three months within, among the communities, the different communities, 
uh, witnessing what's happening, accompanying people, uh, uh, vulnerable people to, to their uh, land, to their schools. Uh, and uh, what is more important is that there is, the, of course, the transformative experience of the person, that the person comes back to his or her you know, constituency transformed, but they do also advocacy in their churches. And I think that that was an important program, uh, and I mean, uh, Audi can say a lot about it. Now, we have initiated also the Palestine-Israel Ecumenical Forum that, uh, that encouraged Palestinians to come together, Christian Palestinians to come together, and you know that they, they also produced the Skeros Palestine document. That, had, that was not a product of the institutional churches in Palestine and Israel, but was deeply representative of the Christian population and expressing uh, their concerns, their, uh, uh, their hopes, but also addressing themselves in a, in a difficult situation of, uh, of oppression and occupation, and addressing their neighbors uh, who are no longer dehumanized, so they recognize in their neighbor the, 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 the person with whom they want to build a, a, a common future. And I think this Christian Palestinian document, although coming from a small community, you know, 2% of the population, had, in my opinion, an, an extremely important impact in so many churches from the World Council of Churches constituency, except the Orthodox churches, where it has been blocked by some Orthodox churches in the States. Uh, it was not, I mean, it has been translated to 22 languages except the Greek language. Um, uh, I mean, there is something that we need to work on in our Orthodox theology in order to, 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 to look at the, at the pain of the people and, and, and I mean, I'm, a born Orthodox, so I have uh, the right to criticize my <laughs> faith, my church, my, I'm not uh, coming to Orthodoxy. But I see our main problem as Orthodox is that we have never assimilated the fourth ecumenical council. We have never understood, put into practice, what does it mean, the two natures of Christ in one person. Incarnation for us is something that we have never, uh, so why don't we, we take the voice of these Palestinian Christians in our churches, listen to them. What are they saying about their situation? It worked with so many other churches, with the Norwegians, the Dutch, the, the groups of, of Christians in parishes have been constituted to support these Christians. They are visiting them, living with them. We Orthodox, when we go, the hundreds of thousands of Russians are coming every week to, to, to Jerusalem. How many? Who goes and visits a family in, in Bethlehem? Who, who, who stays one night in Bethlehem? Who knows that there are Christians in, still in Bethlehem? I'm talking about the Orthodox, the Russian. The Greeks, when they go to, to, I mean, it's probably a little bit different, but still the same. There is a lot to be done in our Orthodox constituency when it comes to solidarity with the Christians in the Middle East. We have to stop saying that they are persecuted. Probably we are persecuted, but let us say that we are persecuted. Don't, don't speak on our behalf, and if you are not able to protect us, come and visit us, come and accompany us, come and be in solidarity with us in our pain. That's, the, that's what, what is missing in our, and I think the WCC is doing what, uh, you know, uh, what we can do, but WCC is like, is like IOCC, WCC is you, is not, me working in Geneva or visiting the region or talking about with the, with the churches in our region. WCC is IOCC, it's, it's, it's constituency, it's members, it's church, member churches. This is where we need the transformation, the building awareness among our members. And this is to be done, it's to be done, I mean, everything is there. If you want to look to the reality, it's there. It's, if you want to look to uh, witness stories coming from the, from the area, from the region, it's there. So, but the effort is not there. Uh, but it's, there is also a lot to be done by the WCC that <laughs> it will take too much time to talk about it.
Yes, just uh, to, to, uh, to, to get back to your question, Professor, about what we can do after this seminar. Uh, I would like really, uh, uh, if, if the, the, the Orthodox communities, uh, not only, I'm not talking about the Greek or Romanian or Antiochians, there are a lot of uh, families, uh, Orthodox families, who uh, came to, to, into the United States recently from Syria and they're really trying to find ways to settle and still struggling, for example, to finalize their papers. Some of them came unofficially, some of them came through their tourist visa. And really, uh, people who really who were enjoyed a good life in, in, in the country, uh, good income, and here they are living here as strangers and really accepting any kind of job in order to cope with the uh, difficult, for example, uh, life conditions. Uh, I don't know to what extent really if we can really uh, offer support uh, because uh, really uh, th they are in a great need at least for example to understand the system, to find jobs with some people who have their own business for example to uh, until really they become part of the society and be being able to continue their life because they don't have any plan to get back very soon. This is one. Secondly, uh, b many young people, potential people, very clever and well educated because of the military service they had to leave the country. Uh, and many of them uh, uh, now uh, are trying to run away through Turkey, for example, through the sea, uh, taking all risk whether they can be survive or die or just to reach, for example, the Greek island and from Greek try to come to any pl other place and also uh, many people uh, uh, want not to graduate uh, 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 to complete their studies because in our system, if they complete their studies, they have really, uh, they can be a subject to for military service and no one would like to join military service. I don't know to what extent really we can really work together to, prov to provide scholarships and really to provide like a, uh, acceptance in different, in the, in different uh, universities, providing scholarship and to enable people to come officially here to continue their studies. I'm sure that in a later stage, uh, uh, the conflict will end one day. We need really to have all potential people, well-educated people in order to rebuild the country in a way or another. It is a very important program to really to see how we can through your own connections. Many, I know that the Greek here uh, uh, Greek Americans have uh, very potential access, let's say, to universities. And there are a lot of uh, wealthy people who would like, I'm sure that they want to offer any kind of support, financial support. I think we can really give hope to many young people who would like to continue their studies and really to save their lives and then to support their families who are still living in the country. So I think we have to go into practical steps not to talk all the time about providing hygiene kits or food kits to the people. They are fed up of, of that. They want really to witness like to have sustainable solutions for their cases. So this is one idea. And the, the idea of that a family can adopt a family still living in our area. A student can adopt a student. If, if a family can send, can send $100 a month to support a family, $100 nowadays, it makes something in our context. If really, if each family can really support the education of one student who do not have the capacity or the ability to pay the tuition fees, it makes a big difference if per year these students can get $300 to continue the study and, 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 and the same for other families who are in need. If a family can support, for example, a patient who needs a lot of money, especially the cancer cases are increasing in the country, due of the conflict, so I think we can make a big difference. And this is, let's say, the true sign of solidarity, not just to talk about the good issues, about, let's say, what we have, let's say, in our Bible. We have to go into practical steps, and $100, for example, for a family per month may, 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 may not create any burden on, on any family here. But we need, really, to structure that program and really to organize it in a way to make it, let's say, efficient, and goes directly, let's say, to the point. And I think we, and I, with IOCC, we can really do a great deal, not depending on only funding coming from here and there just to buy kits and to buy, for example, food or something like this. To have a sustainable programs, 
because because if we lose the education, if we lose, let's say, and, and Christians all the time, in our context, used to be the elite of the society, not in terms of money, but in terms of education. And in, if we have educated people, then we can guarantee, for example, a healthy uh, 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 society in the future. Thank you. Uh, please join me in giving this panel a round of applause. Doc, doctor, did you have a question? Did you have a final question? Because it's your birthday and we... Uh, I have a final okay. the organization. <laughs> for those who've uh, asked us to come, for those who volunteered to pay for our expenses, so as to open the opportunity for us to speak on behalf of our people and on behalf of our churches. We are not trying to big, but we are trying to put realities on the table so you can understand and I am uh, sure that you have the, uh, more than the enough wisdom to judge what is the right action which you have to take. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank everyone who helped uh, make this conference a colloquium uh, possible. Um, you really helped carry the brunt of it. Um, I want to thank, of course, the speakers. It was because of you that you took time out to come from Africa, from Serbia, from you know Geneva and beyond, uh, Syria, Jordan, New York, um, and Boston. Even the traffic from uh, you know Boston traffic is tough. Uh, you know it's because you are committed to this kind of work that this colloquium I think is successful. I. Um, I just want to close with a reflection from the video that Samer showed us. Um, it's, it was very, very moving. Um, kind of to think that if, um, if I'm not homeless, how can I help someone who's homeless? If I, if I am not sick, um, how can I help someone who's sick? If I'm not um, poor, how can I, if I'm not hungry, how can I feed someone who's hungry? Um, it's, it's very, very humbling. Um, the only thing that I can say is that uh, I think we are all broken. We're all hungry and we're all homeless uh, because we are still searching um, for, for God in our lives. And um, I guess maybe that's the solidarity that we can show our people um, in the United States who are um, suffering, but across the world. Uh, I thank you for sharing that, and we will make sure to get that to everyone. Um, thank you very much. Christ is risen. Thank you.